Now, you've recently um, actually taken an interest in weight loss, right? So the dietary interventions that can be efficacious for, for weight loss and, and treating things like metabolic syndrome. So let's yeah. build off this idea a little bit, but how do you incorporate um, the strategy around reducing energy intake, right? Because because that's this is sort of how I think about weight yeah. loss, right? Like you got to reduce the intake, but I think of right. three broad ways that you can approach that. So three strategies, right? One is you just reduce calories and that becomes the only focus. So you 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 pay attention to the total energy content of food without thinking about the timing of food or the macro distribution of food. The next approach is you spend less time thinking about the total number of calories, spend more time thinking about the macronutrients, create, I, I describe it as sort of create a boogeyman in the diet, some things that you avoid, and the yeah. restriction of certain things becomes a roundabout way to restrict total energy. And then right. we talked about time restriction as well as another strategy. Um, so if, how, how, do you, how do you think about manipulating that middle bucket of yeah. you know, changing macros to achieve yeah. energy deficit. So I totally agree. Weight management is a calorie issue. And it's not the same for every individual. Everybody's got a little different efficiency. So, you know, we understand it's not, you can't be an accountant and expect to just count calories all the time. But um, let me build it as a story of how we thought about it. Uh, back in the late 90s, uh, the keto, you know, Atkins and the keto diet were out there and Barry Sears and uh, protein, you know, the zone diet and Mike Gilead's and the protein power. And I was looking at all of those things and we were doing those leucine experiments and we had discovered this effect of leucine on muscle protein turnover and some of these metabolic things with, you know, fat metabolism. And I basically took the leap of faith and said, you know, I think the underpinning of all of these diets is really the protein carb ratio. And how can we manipulate that? And so I started thinking, well, you know, if we're gonna create diets, one, we know that from a satiety standpoint, protein is probably the most satiating, you know, lowers fat would be next, carbohydrate the least. Uh, we were concerned about big insulin swings, so we wanted to sort of balance out our carbs per meal. We know that if people are overweight, they tend to have big post-meal -carbo post carbohydrate and insulin swings where they get two hours later, they'll have insulin low, uh, carbohydrate lows. And so we started trying to think about that and we said, okay, so we think the first meal after an overnight fast is critical. So we're gonna correct that. So we basically started saying, how much protein do you need? 30, 40 grams of protein uh, to get both satiety, protein synthesis effects. Um, we knew that protein had a higher thermogenic effect, burns more calories, more heat than either carb or fat. So we wanted to front load that effect. People have argued that, well, that's because protein are the nitrogen, it's harder to digest and absorb. We don't think that's true at all. We think the thermogenic effect is stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Mm. We know that that is a massive ATP expenditure. And so what we wanna do is maximize that at every meal. So our first meal, we wanted to be 40 grams of protein. We wanted to have a carb level that would not overstimulate insulin. So we kept that under around 30 grams for what we created a carbohydrate threshold concept uh, we can go into, and then fat sort of to round out the calories. And we basically developed three meals a day to distribute like that. Uh, we basically increased the protein to about 1.6 grams per kg, and we ran the study comparing it to the food guide pyramid with 0.8. So as far as we could tell, we did three different studies, one a total feeding study where we fed everyone, a second study with diet and exercise that was four months, and a third study was multi-centered with 120 subjects that lasted 16 months. And so we did three studies. The, the, and and the, last, saw, the last two were free living where they were, resp total, they were, total, they were responsible well, for the food, but the first one they were fed? The first one we fed them in the lab so we knew exactly what they were eating. Yeah. The second one, we actually fed them for their first two weeks for a few meals so they really saw what it would look yep. like. 
And the last one was totally free living based on the diets and manuals that we developed. And, and each of these was two arms where the only difference was the protein? So in the first one, it was two arms, uh, food guide pyramid, high carb, low protein versus higher protein, low carb. The second one was two by two. So we basically had the diet treatment and then we had a resistance exercise treatment. Mm -hmm. So high protein, low exercise, high yep. protein, high, et cetera. And then the last one was diet uh, with a generic recommendation for exercise, but two by uh, just a two treatment effect. So what did the first experiment show, the really well-controlled one? Mm -hmm. So the, the well-controlled one, what we found was that with the higher protein, and as far as we could measure exactly the same calorie intake, the people on the higher protein, low carb, lost more total weight, more total fat, and less lean and that stabilized their insulin and glycemic regulations and lowered their triglycerides across the board. And what, do you remember what the difference was in, in weight and um, fat mass? And, and, and was it all explained by so, the thermodynamics of the um, delt difference in protein? It was close. We, we found that based on, you know, if you just, if you assume that body fat is a you know 3,500 calories, and you can make that calculation. <laughs> we we found we figured out that uh, the people on the higher protein diet uh, were getting a benefit of a I think it was around 170 calories a day eating the same calories. Yep. So that could be about a, the thermodynamic effect. And so, in other words, that that amount spread out over the duration of the study explained the difference in weight loss. Right. So both groups lost weight. They were both on weight loss diets, right. but the pr protein people lost, uh, and I didn't look those numbers up, but they lost around eight pounds more and almost all of, you know, something like, you know, six and a half of it was fat. And did they also um, complain less of hunger or was there a difference subjectively yeah. between the groups? Yeah, uh, we did. We did a satiety uh, check in that uh, really just a uh, uh, using an analog scale. We just ask them to rate how they felt and stuff. And one of the things that the dietitians who were running the study always came back is they said that the the protein people were never talking about food and snacks, but the people on the high carb diet were always talking about being hungry and snacking. And so, yeah, there's definitely a different satiety and compliance issue to it. And, and the, I we assume also, the fat was in constant longer, in that study. In the longer term studies, in the first study, which was only 12 weeks, basically all subjects in both groups finished the study. In the longer studies, we got into four months and longer, uh, we found much higher dropout rates in the high carb group too. So did the results of all three studies point in the same direction, which was exactly. a higher protein weight loss? So a protein sparing weight loss diet, which gets back to your point earlier, stop thinking about protein as a percent of total calories. Protein should always be absolute. And if you want to yeah. think about it that way, it's actually, it should, as, as you reduce calories, protein should increase the total fraction of calories, um, right is going to preserve lean tissue better, maintain satiety better, and plus there's potentially this bonus of the thermogenic effect of protein. Right, it definitely partitions the weight loss toward fat, protects muscle, lean tissue, definitely has higher satiety, um, you know. And w one of the things we know, and in fact, for a long time, there was a lot of debate whether people over 60 should ever try practice weight loss because they would they lose, lose too, too much, much lean bass and they can't gain it back. Um, you know, their, Doug Patton Jones had the theory that uh, sarcopenic aging isn't a gradual decline, it's a series of acute effects that you injure yourself, you're in bed, you're, you have a surgery, whatever, you acutely lose lean mass and you can never gain it back. So we were concerned about that. We want, we want weight loss, but we don't want people to lose any lean mass, especially if they're adults. If you're a 20 year old, it probably doesn't matter so much, but if you're older, you know, if you're beyond 40, it does matter. It's a scary thought, Don, if you think about it, right? I mean, 40 is yeah. not that old. 
And yet, yeah. um, you know, I, I recently had shoulder surgery. Uh, so as with the time that we're recording this, I'm probably about five months out from that so shoulder surgery. And um, I, I still have not gained back all of the, the, the muscle mass. Yeah. Now, I think I will gain it back. Um, but I look at how difficult it has been yeah. and how acutely I lost it. I mean, within three yeah. weeks, I was... 10 pounds lighter. I lost 10 pounds yeah. of body weight. Yeah. And it's obviously not just from the shoulder. It's when you don't have an arm, you can't squat, you can't yeah. deadlift, you can't do all of these other things. So I, I would bet that, you know, obviously some of that was water weight, but look, I think seven yeah. of those 10 pounds was lean tissue that I lost in, in, a, in a span of three weeks. There's some tremendous research by my colleague, Doug Patton Jones, who on fortunately passed away this last year, um, who did a lot of that kind of bed rest sort of study and looking at older adults versus younger. And in the same period of time, an older adult in bed rest will lose four times as much muscle as a younger adult. It's, it's frightening how fast you can lose it. And you know, to your point, if you're diligent and do weight training, you can begin to gain it back, but it's hard to ever get back to ground zero if you lose it in aging. And people will ask me, well, all this loosing stuff, when does it really come into play? You know, is it as, it's not as important for a 20 year old as it is for a 60, but where's the middle ground? You know, where does it change? And I think it's a little like bone health. I think once you're, once you're 40, you're sort of on the back end of that and you need to be much more careful. Doug and I ran a study, which, you know, everybody quotes now where we, took 90 grams of protein and looked at it, distributed as three meals per day, 30, 30, 30, versus 10, 20, 60. Mm -hmm. uh, and we found that with the same amount of protein, the same overall diet, uh, you would have higher net protein synthesis with the distri distribution to breakfast. So that's kind of where all the distribution data came from was that study. And uh, we ran that study in 37 year olds. The average age was 37. So we think that by mid 30s, you can detect the distribution effects. And just to be clear, Don, do you think that the reason 30, 30, 30 was better than 10, 20, 60 because you started the day at 30 or because you had three meals where you cleared the hepatic threshold? That's a great question and one that I wish the Twitter world would understand. I think the effect is moving at the breakfast, the first meal. I think that, frankly, we'd have been better you off if we ran this. should have done it 20 10 as the other arm, right? That would be the- No, I think, it I think it should have been, I think it should have been 40, what's the math, 40, 10, 40. I think the first and last meals mm -hmm. are the key. Okay. The, and, and I'll give you the reason for that. We've done a number of studies in animals uh, other people, Mike Rennie and, and uh, Phil Atherton have done it in humans. But when you trigger mTOR at that first meal, we know that it's still stimulated five hours later. Mm -hmm. So why do you need leucine for mTOR at lunch if it's still stimulated? You don't. So there's nobody has actually studied that at this unless, point. Unless you're the person who just is so big you know, like you're lame, right? Like if you're lame and you're, right. you weigh 200 pounds and you're a bodybuilder. But, he, but the key to what you just said is now you're talking total protein per day, right. not a leucine effect. Yeah, yes, exactly. It's no, it's not a leucine mTOR effect. That's right. It's There's total not this substrate. threshold it's total to it. Substrate. Yeah. It's, it's okay, Lane needs 250 grams of protein per day. He'd be better off putting that in four or five meals yeah. than putting it in two. Yeah. So that's the difference that people need to understand is that distributing across all the meals, if it's for weight loss and appetite, that's great, but it's not an mTOR effect. Uh -huh.